Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Thanks to my sponsor this week, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. So, hey everyone, welcome. This is the second ever, I can say second annual, right? Does yeah. it need to happen? Second yeah, yeah, yeah. that's how it works. That's, that's yeah, legit. there's there's a pattern. Yeah. This is the holiday gift guide episode of Music Ed Tech Talk. Uh, last year, David, you were on, but I thought it would be really fun to add Craig, two, two of the most frequent and reoccurring guests on the show. Craig McClellan, my co-host of the Class Nerd Podcast. I still say it like it's present tense. Go check that show out. <laughs> it is in our hearts. And... Dr. David McDonald here, um, person <laughs> person of interest, should we say your podcast, Scory Notes, co-host per- on Person the about Notes. the internet. <laughs> person of the internet, yeah. composer, music theory and composition educator, Scory Notes podcast host. I'll link it all in the notes. If you listen to the show, you are familiar with these people. We're going to talk about stuff that we recommend that you buy if you were looking for gift ideas for someone or for yourself. Some of them are kind of expensive. If we're being particularly honest, I think these are mostly gifts for the people listening to this program already. Yep. I Yeah, I mean, I think like the the, the idea of a gift guide is a nice theme for sure, but this is really that we could title this just as easily stuff we like. But first, I thought I would do some music ed and technology news and just go over a couple things real fast and they'll be real fast. The first is, let me reorder these here in the outline. So the first is I got some follow up asking what a GT band is because in episode 62, I mentioned that I was hosting the auditions for our district's local GT band. GT means gifted and talented. I don't like that we use that name for our honors programs. We could get all into like the talent conversation and like, should we eradicate that word? Would its meaning live on even if we did? Or do we redefine it? Do the Suzuki, you know, Suzuki had the talent education title, you know, for his program. So I don't know, but we call it the gifted and talented bands or orchestras or whatever, whatever the, you know, the type of performing ensemble is. So that's what that is. So, um, you know, Apple is releasing a very cool app called Freeform, which is like a giant collaborative whiteboard thing that you can link up with, with a bunch of people and collaborate on. You can do it inside of a FaceTime call. I'm reading very good things about it, that it is like pulling in some really cool technologies from the iWork suite, as well as some like things that Apple Notes can do. It seems like it's a really nice blend of a lot of different like kind of past and present Apple technologies and like it, it like it's, it just seems really fun. I know white whiteboard apps, collaborative, you know, things. I mean, Jamboard was a big thing for us in the um, virtual learning environment a few years back. These things are common. Like I know Canva has a new one for mobile that is like has come out recently. So I don't know. Do you have a take on these kinds of things? I, I don't think it's a thing that is a particular interest to me beyond the toy of it. But I, I feel like if I'm doing whiteboarding stuff, that's a that's a solo act. I don't I don't want anybody else messing up my my whiteboards fair i think for for me i'm excited i i work on a team for an ed tech company and and we do a lot of content creation and so i think it'll be interesting for us especially combined with the collaboration features that have launched as part of ios 16 i i'm i'm definitely excited to try it and i think some of the pieces like the rich links you know when you drop a link it's not just you know, text, but it's the the rich link like in notes, things like that really make this thing shine. So I'm, I'm excited to play around with it. I, I like the idea of collaborating. I think it's maybe at least for the things that I do, possibly going to be more useful for asynchronous collaboration than like they, they kept demoing it as though you've got like four people standing around <clears> a big <throat> table with a big sheet of paper all writing at the same time. But I don't like. I can't imagine collaborating that way being particularly in a, effective at anything. But I could totally imagine it, like an ongoing kind of brainstorm. Like I've thought of the thing, and I'll add a node to the mind map or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I dig that. I, I like the idea of because there's like I've experimented with a lot of these kind of open canvas apps. But this seems like it's going to strike a really good balance between friendly to use, but also like some of the powerful like easy formatting features of the iWork stuff, like the shape tools mixed in with like some of the text formatting, um, but also like the handwritten Apple Pencil stuff that you can do in Apple Notes. And I'm just kind of thrilled to try it out. Speaking of mobile apps, 
that are cool. Ableton Note, has anybody tried that? I have not, but it seems like a very good idea. This is like, this is the thing that is the, the maybe more fully featured version of like a, like a music notes type of thing where you're, you're trying to kind of sketch out an idea for, for a song that's kind of singing into your phone in, in the music notes or voice memos kind of, kind of sense, but you're doing so with some like basic looping technology and stuff from Ableton. I haven't tried it at all. It's really slick. I tried it on the phone and I'm so glad I did. I, I don't know what it looks like on the iPad, but on the phone, it's like, it, it sort of is, it's sort of it's like having a little mini Ableton push on your phone, hmm. but it's doing super smart stuff to sort of always be recording your ideas. Even There's no record button, which I love. So you just open up, it's sort of like, if you know the session view in Ableton, then you'll be pretty comfortable with it. And you sort of, sort of like go into a clip and you select an instrument and then it gives you a little grid of squares that's sort of tuned to a scale. And uh, you just start, can start noodling with it. And as you start tapping the keys, you can sort of see these like, they look kind of like, you know, what's the technical term for the little, you know, the representation of notes that you play on the piano roll, the little colorful rectangles. I don't know. Uh, I was about to say piano roll, but the notes themselves, the individual well, they, notes. Yeah. yeah. You start tapping on this thing and then the notes sort of just start zooming by from right to left as if like <clears throat> you see that they happened in the past. And it's sort of at first like what's going on. And then if you like keep tapping, and eventually there's like a little button on the bottom that basically like when you're done just sort of tapping out your idea and you tap this button, it loops it, but it starts with wherever you started tapping around. So a lot of times like an idea hmm. comes to you before you're actually ready to hit the record button and the act of like having to kind of stop your flow and like hit record sort of like takes out this like the creative juice. So it's kind of just like always recording whatever you do. And if you record a little pattern, tap it, and then go into another software instrument, you can really easily layer something on top because it just kind of keeps playing your previous thing. It's really slick, even if I didn't understand the iconography. Every button did exactly what I thought it would do on the first tap or something smarter than what I thought <laughs> it would do. It's only $6. Like, it's that's, that's a great, I'm, I need to download this now. Right. It reminds me of like right. when I've, the, I've downloaded yeah. it and I haven't haven't launched it once yet. When the iPhone was pretty young, a lot of these things were coming out and they were always just sort of novelty to me. This is the smartest and most, you know, well designed of any of these tools. But it, it actually makes me think like that I would use it. You know, it's the first of these in a while that I think to myself like, hey, I actually can like you can get something good down on this and then like import it to a bigger project. So and I think that's the thing that like Apple saw that people were using voice memos and they made music memos to help them with this, this, this process. But basically it was the same as voice memos, but with like a longer recording cap and like a couple of special like metadata things. It wasn't really a music tool. And I think that's what makes this cool is it's made by people who understand how music tools can be made. And especially like the, the real time creative element that, that is kind of the heart of live is there in something like Ableton note. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I really like the way they're thinking. It's kind of, to me as proof though, that Ableton would be cool on a tablet, but whatever. <laughs> it doesn't seem like they're going to do that. So speaking of Ableton, do you want to talk about Ableton link and logic? Because I don't, I haven't really played with it at all. I haven't, I haven't either. I just put it in there because it was a thing that was seemed related to Ableton note. I, I don't know any, I just know that Ableton link is a thing that exists that people play with. You can maybe remove that if you don't have anything to say about it. Cause I don't, I, I mean, it is now supported in logic, which I think just, you know, anytime you can take a really nice power tool and link it up to a really nice other power tool is, is good. So this means that if you've got like systems that work for you in Ableton, but there are tools in Logic or instruments in Logic that, that you really want access to or the Logic Loops library, those Apple Loops, some of them are pretty good. The Apple drumming yeah. stuff is pretty good. And so you could connect that to other ways that you have of controlling Ableton and have everything work together. Having said that, that's a, that's a lot of stuff going on on one computer. So I don't know if I would trust that to just any old computer either yeah it reminds me of what's the thing that reason used to be able to do someone who rewire. knows is yeah someone who knows more about ableton will correct this analogy but yeah rewire would like let you sort of like um kind of like chain together it would let you sort of like have you know like a pro tools project or a logic project sort of like control the tempo of a Sibelius project simultaneously. Like you would run both apps together side by side and the project tempos would sync up. So if you had like a string quartet accompaniment that you were composing to like some rock tune, you could like kind of hear the, the, the recording session and the, you know, the string parts you had composed in real, you know, 
in sync, which was cool. And it can work across multiple devices too, which is pretty cool if you're if you're working collaboratively collaboratively with other people. That's I think one of the big things that you get from Link. Yeah, yeah, like in live settings, like you can have a bunch of different instant like computers with Ableton running on them, and have right. you know everybody's tempo. Right. right. Sync up. Right. Boom. Um, all right. Let's talk about stuff we like. Uh, we've got this broken into some categories. We've got books, software, services, hardware and gadgets. And then I thought, like, Craig, the, the idea to have you come on is we've been talking a lot about pens and bags and stuff over the past six or so months. So I have I been we, a very bad influence on you. You have been a very bad influence on me. So I thought we would talk about some, I don't know, for lack of a better word, some analog stuff outside of books, which we did talk about in last year's version of this episode. So let's kick this off here with books. Um, we've got a, a couple on here. I think they're all somewhat loosely related to the music, you know, music or the music classroom. Actually, David, you just added a few in here. I'll just, I'll just link two together. There's two books I read this year that stuck out that were, were good enough that I, even though I read them on Kindle, I bought a, a hard copy of each one to like give to people. And I, it's not like I read the first one and then discovered that the author had other books and then went out. I actually like later learned about the second book I'm going to mention, and only after I bought it because it sounded interesting did I realize it was the same author. The first book is so I'll say Dan Charnas is the author of both books, and the first book is Dilla Time, which is a you know it it covers the influence of Jay Dilla, the hip hop producer who I, I feel like I'm going to be both. I don't know. This seems like something you have to say, but also it feels a little reductive, but whatever. It's the kind of, it's kind of like one of his legacies is how he sampled jazz records and soul records and like tried to imitate the feeling of real drummers using, but kind of ran into limits with the, is it the MPC 30? I don't want to mess that up. Hold on. What's the famous drum machine that he used? This is uh, 808. No, it is the, oh, it is the MPC. Yeah. So the, uh, is it Akai who makes it? Mm A-K-A-I. Yeah. So this, you know, this was like one of his primary production devices. It, the limitations that he ran into trying to imitate the feeling of real drummers sort of inspired him to sort of like purposefully take his sampling and his his drumming and sort of like take it off the grid, but in a way that actually ended up creating kind of a unique and different feeling from even the way that like human drummers played, which now because of how pervasive hip hop music is in our culture has been a drumming style that lots of drummers have then gone back and then tried to imitate that sound. Like Quest Love is probably the most famous household name who has devoted his life to sort of studying this kind of feel in drum set playing and, and imitating that. So that's, oh. I, thought the, I thought it was a really interesting book to read. It had a lot of artists referred to in it that I like and listen to quite a lot. Uh, it really kind of changed my perspective on his influence. But what's crazy is then like months later when I was recording the episode of this show on building a second music teacher brain with Dr. Corey Meals, he mentioned a book called Clean Work, which is all about, I think conceptual technology is the term he used to categorize this kind of book, but it basically is like this idea of taking the the idea of mise en place in the culinary industry and then applying that to your like mm. personal and professional life by sort of creating mm. systems. It's a very, if, you like, if you're into the like PKM and um, second brain or just into productivity to any degree, this is definitely a book for you. It's all about sort of like creating systems for yourself, both digital and not, but basically having a, a place for everything in your workflow and how to have, he has lots of like interviews and stories and quotes from like chefs all over the world. And like, it's, it's kind of cool. It was like really in my wheelhouse and it's, re it's really good. And it's the same guy. I, and he's just, I guess, writes about what he wants to. That's really interesting. I think one of the downsides of a lot of the kind of productivity book and resources that I'm aware of is that they don't seem to apply super easily to creative work that's like really open-ended. And so this seems like something that, that would be really interesting for, for that. Yeah, he really does a good job of, of leaving it open-ended. There's not a whole lot of very prescriptive ideas in it, which works well cool. for me. So I added a couple of books to the outline as well. One of them is a book that I just actually gave a presentation about a few weeks ago as we're recording this in Baltimore, of all places. I, I actually got to hang out with Robbie in Robbie's studio. And this is a, a book called Critique is Creative. It, and the kind of main person behind this book is a choreographer named Liz Lerman. She co-authored it with John Borstel. And this is an update of her earlier book called Liz Lerman's 
critical response process. And so critical response is this, this structured system for giving feedback in a way that is really practical and is not mean. And it does a really interesting job of separating the creative intent of somebody who's making open-ended stuff from their ability to execute on that thing and then later also the value of that intent. And so this is a way that I give to my students and that I have them give feedback to one another in our composition master classes, which if you've never been in a composition master class can often be very unhelpful and sometimes even kind of mean in toxic environments. And this is a really useful system for that. So it's a really new book. It just came out this year. That's an update to her earlier book. And even though she's a choreographer, she writes about how you can apply this system to all different kinds of creativity. And this newer version of the book actually includes some chapters contributed by other creative professionals who are working. Some of them are also working in dance, but some of them are working in other fields as well. So if you are like working with students and asking them to give critique to one another, this could be a really useful framework, even if you don't use it in its entirety, it can be a really useful framework for, for doing that in a way that's actually useful and meaningful to your students. The other book I'm going to recommend is not necessarily like a, like a book book. This is a, a music book. This is called New Standards 101 Lead Sheets by Women Composers. And this is a, a new book that just came out this year that if you are, are are trying to develop a curriculum or develop a repertoire that is more inclusive and shows students in particular that any one of them could be just as important to the future of music as any of the other people that they are studying and playing and singing in their classes and in their ensembles. This is a really good way to do that. Some of these, I haven't, there's 101 of them and it only came out a few months ago, so I've not spent a deep time with every single lead sheet in this book, but some of the things that are here are really cool. So there's all kinds of, of lead sheets from, from people that you've heard of and people that you've not heard of, and it's definitely worth your time. So if you, if you are interested in working in jazz or even not jazz, and you just want to show your students examples of lead sheets or use them yourself, this is a really good new, new resources of contemporary lead sheets by women composers. We got to do a whole book episode, man. I, I always write down everything that you uh, mentioned when we go this route. Um, well, at that conference that I mentioned a moment ago, I came away with about a year's worth of reading. So we'll, we'll have to do that sometime. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's worth doing a whole, a whole episode on books because, um, yeah, I, I just, I just clipped both these. Did you hear two seconds of we shopping music, by the way? I did not. Oh, oh good. I, I thought, in, I, thought I wish I just, had though. I wish I, I had you, heard two seconds of we shopping music. I, I saw that. Thought I saw you saw you acknowledge it for a moment and then power through. I have mm -hmm. I have a Chrome extension that plays the Wii Shopping music when I'm on Amazon. That's, <laughs> Looking that's links. because you've made good decisions in your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! All right, I put I put these both on my list here. Um, all right, let's, amazing. Let's take it to um, software. And we've got a couple of app picks here. Uh, I guess we should talk about how to get software because, and I, and I maybe if again we did this last year too. If, like a, a philosophical question about software: Do you all ask for software as holiday gifts, and does anybody ever give you any? <laughs> Because for me, it's yes and no is how I would answer. No, I, I do not. I just it's. I feel like with my family, it is complicated to try and explain how you would go about that, or what even the value of it is. It's. It, I think it's a lot of times it's hard to gift software, and so, especially with the way the App Store works now, where so much stuff is like a freemium thing, where it's an in-app purchase to really get the thing which you can't gift anyway, it's it's really hard. There, there are so many apps that I would love to gift my colleagues that I just can't because it only exists as an in-app purchase. And and I know this is a thing that I'm sure has come up many, 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 many times in, in the podcast and in our conversations with other people. So many people are just completely unwilling to spend any money at all on software, especially mobile apps. And sometimes I really want to buy somebody this thing because I think it's genuinely going to make their life better. And it's like $6. Like, why wouldn't I? Like, I would buy my friend lunch. Why wouldn't I just buy them the $6 app to make their life better every day? And I just can't because the app store is dumb. 
I think that's a good sales pitch for us going going this route because like there and listen like if you're thinking to yourself like you know I don't know about this you can always get someone an app store gift card they used to maybe you know this one or both of you if you if you can still do this but you used to be able to actually like get a code a gift code for an app like buy an app on the app store and then email someone a code can you still do that yeah I you can spot- still do that but it doesn't yeah. work for in-app purchases right right of course so there's ways to, to kind of work around this. I know that some people, like I remember the year I started like asking for like Nintendo Switch games, like the digital codes instead of the, and then like my family just, we all like our Amazon wishlist shoppers. So people just stopped buying me video games the second I started doing that. And it's a little sad and less fun, but you know what? It's fine. I still love to buy software. My wife has no problem getting a Kindle email in her email inbox on Christmas morning, whatever. Software is great. It can make your life better. So let's let's do it. Craig, are you one password? I am, and mine actually kind of solves that problem in that if you don't purchase one password through the app store, but directly from one password and you do their whole purchase, you can actually give somebody a one password gift card, which is basically the amount of a sus- subscription for a year. So I did this for my dad and his wife a few years ago. I don't remember if it was Christmas or a birthday or something, but I really wanted to help my dad start using more secure passwords and and have some of that security because he's relatively tech savvy, but would never have thought about that. And he's an accountant and like has his clients' data and then their family's data. And so I gave them the gift of one year of one password family. And they have subsequently like renewed and keep using it. And it's kind of become part of how they operate as a family. At least I think that's what they say. But Either way, it has gone over really well. And when I explained kind of what it was, and then after I handed them the gift card and said, let me help you get this set up, it ended up working really well. So it, it, I think it's a, a pretty good gift in terms of software. I, I think I, everybody needs a password manager. I This is one yes. of the first things I install when I get a new device. And it's one of the, you know, one of the things I continue to pay you know monthly for yeah I, I i actually also have it i have one password for families that I, I i to solve craig's problem i just have my parents on my one password for families plan mm, that's good yeah i can imagine using this because you know sometimes i do get called in for grandma tech support yep. and i have you know one of the things you can do is create a secure note if you don't really know like what category something falls into you can just sort of like freely write in a note that requires you to like authenticate with your phone. And uh, so I have some of my grandmother's passwords for things like just in notes, but it would be cool to just, you know, have a shared vault. Of course, I'm like, I'm cringing at the idea of teaching my grandma to use one password, but I could probably teach my mom to use it. Right? Yeah. All right, I'll go next. Farago is my pick. And this is a soundboard app for the Mac. And this just I don't know, I think this is something that clicks with people. I talk about a lot of nerdy stuff on this show, but every time I show somebody Farago, they light up when they see the potential of it. It is designed kind of like for, you know, doing things like this, like podcasting or like radio shows. You basically just, the interface of it gives you a grid of squares and you can drag MP3 files into the grid, organize them in any layout you want, color code them, and you can on a whim tap them with your mouse or trackpad, or you can assign them keyboard shortcuts. It's, it's a delight. I mean, one of the things I do in the band classroom a lot is I have a lot of like queued up play along tracks that I use very regularly. I could definitely use YouTube or like even, a, a you know, a, an iTunes playlist for these, but they would be harder to locate because they're, they would be smaller touch targets, you know, and also they're not like as organized or color coded. Like I have some of my scale exercise play along tracks color coded in order organized by circle of fifths. So like, it's just really easy if the band is running a couple scales, it's really easy to find everything. You can assign a keyboard shortcut. So I, I used Farago a lot last summer. I was teaching a first year music theory class that was like a, a kind of catch up for students who missed it for whatever reason of, of a first year theory class. But I was doing it online because most college students are not around town in the summers. And so I was using Farago a lot for teaching theory through Zoom. And every day I would clip my my whatever audio of whatever musical examples I was using. And I actually used another Rogue Amoeba product, Fission, to do that. And then I just dragged them straight into Farago. And then I had a row for each week of the class of the musical examples. And so I had everything. So if I ever wanted to go back, hey, do you remember this thing we listened to a couple weeks ago? It was right there in the Farago project. It was really, really useful for, for teaching stuff online. Could not agree more. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. 
So I guess I guess I, I, I'm next, and that is the this is an app. I'm surprised I checked last year's gift guide to make sure that I wasn't repeating myself. I was surprised this didn't come up last time because this is one of my favorite applications. And this is the the family of creative applications from Affinity, formerly Serif. I think they've probably changed their name. Anyway, Affinity Designer, Affinity Photo, Affinity Publisher. These exist for Mac and Windows and the first two of them exist for iPad, publisher soon to exist for iPad. And these are basically drop-in replacements for Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, and InDesign. I think publisher is probably the, well, it is the youngest of those three and is maybe the least capable of a drop-in replacement for InDesign. And also InDesign does a lot of kind of proprietary PDF stuff that Adobe doesn't let other people do anyway. But it's a, they're really good applications and they're considerably less costly than their Adobe counterparts. They are on a normal day, 50 bucks one time, and they go on sale not super frequently, but I, I would expect them to go on sale for Black Friday. I would expect them to go on sale probably another time of the year during the summer or something like that. And when they go on sale, they usually go on sale 30, 40, 50% off. So you can get something that is as capable for what certainly what I need to do and probably for what most people need to do as Adobe Illustrator for less than it would cost to get Adobe Creative Cloud for one month. So it's a, they're really good applications. They run on, like I said, Mac, Windows, and iPad. It's, they're really fun to use. I, I've really enjoyed using them. And I basically have not opened Illustrator in a, in a few years or Photoshop in a few years because I just opened these Affinity products. I've been using Publisher a lot lately for preparing big, long documents for like course packets or something like that. I used it for my, my tenure portfolio that I that I did recently, like I've I've used it for a lot of stuff. It's pretty nice. I'm pumped that that's coming to iPad soon. I'm very excited. They had an announcement recently, and they they teased a, a what like a like a one more thing. I wonder if it's publisher for iPad, but I feel like they've kind of already said that's coming. So maybe it's something else. Maybe it's going to be like I feel like the big thing that I don't have is a Lightroom replacement. That's a digital asset manager that can work like Lightroom. And if they could do something like that, I feel like a lot of people could jump ship from Adobe. Yep, that would be cool. Really cool. Well, the next one on the list is me. I put it there. It's Drafts. And so many episodes of this show, you can learn about what Drafts is. But it is the place where text starts. I Most things that I write on my phone start with me writing in a draft. It's got fun actions that you can tap on to send your text to a message, a tweet, an email, a to-do, and anything. You can customize your own actions. It does. It, it's just a really, really cool app. When I said earlier that I once gifted my administration at my school an App Store gift code for an app, it was this app. I gave it all to them. I said, this makes me more productive. Here you go. And it's got some f- ways to even more quickly get to the like typing your text faster. Uh, now there are lock screen widgets on the iPhone version of it, which is usually where I you know, add stuff if I'm on the go. And I have a little permanently visible plus button on my home or my lock screen of my phone, where if I tap it, it just opens a brand new note and drafts for me to start typing. So really, really nice app. Cannot recommend it enough. The the next app is, is something that I would like to recommend, and that is for anybody that has Bluetooth devices connected to their Mac, especially if you've got AirPods or AirPods Pro or AirPods Max or whatever, I personally do not let them switch automatically between devices because it goes wrong just frequently enough that it annoys me. And so I like to do that switching manually. And I think AirBuddy is is an app from independent developer Guillermo Rambo. And Rambo has done a really nice job of making this feel like a really nice native app to control your Bluetooth connections. You can use it to quickly switch the Bluetooth connection of any any device, including things that are not like AirPods. It is designed to kind of look and work and feel like the AirPods user interface. But if you want to use this for your magic trackpad or your keyboard or whatever, it works really great for that as well. To switch between different devices, it's really clever in the way that it shows you and snags the Bluetooth connection from another device. So I use that a lot and it's just a little menu bar app. I'm sorry for the crackling, Hope that's not a big deal. It's just a little menu bar app that that looks kind of like an AirPods case combined with the, the Happy Mac icon. And click it, 
connect your AirPods and your AirPods are connected to your Mac and you don't have to go into the Bluetooth settings or anything like that to, to, to deal with those connections. I had completely forgotten about this app. I had the original version one, and uh, but version two added the ability to work with the Magic Keyboard and trackpad and some of those things. And I remember hearing about that and going, oh, I should get that. And then I never did. I think you just... This is the first time I'm I'm spending money on this episode is on that. <laughs> well, Craig lost Craig lost the bet. I mean, I already added the, your two your two books to my wish list, but I didn't buy them yet. So I guess yeah, Craig, you down to me and Robbie. <laughs> all right, is is the is it who spends money live on the air or it's, it's who, yeah yeah okay it's who's the last one to spend money live on the air? I mean, I oh, okay. I haven't done it yet, but I'm I'm in process right now. Okay, he's in the checkout workflow. Yeah. I think that. Counts. Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> Buy AirBuddy to click. Oh, did I add? I'm supposed to be well, talking. The, the, now. I got distracted. I, the, I have another. The only app. reason I haven't. The only reason I haven't bought anything yet is because I own all these apps already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for for years, yeah, you know, back a long time ago, before Fantastical, the the calendar app switched to a subscription model. I used it, but then when they went subscription. I don't have anything against subscriptions. I pay for a lot of app subscriptions, but this one just didn't feel worth it to me. I didn't feel like I used it enough for work. We are so Microsoft focused. And so I use Outlook for everything and I have very few personal calendars. So I I just didn't see the need to pay for this subscription. And Robbie kept telling me, Craig, you really should be using Fantastical. He, He texted me about it constantly. And what finally did it for me and why I'm recommending it is iOS 16 and focus filters. So yes, you can do this to an extent with the built-in calendar app, but Fantastical has calendar groups or sets. I can't remember which one they call it. And so you can have sets, thank you. So you can have multiple sets. And then depending on what focus you're in on your devices and the focus syncs between all your Apple devices, you can have it show only particular calendars. And then when you combine that with lock screen widgets and always on lock screen from the iPhone 14 Pro, it really starts to be interesting. So like I have a weekend focus mode and one of the main things that that does is it takes all my work appointments off of my calendar. And so on my lock screen, you know, if there's, you know, not that I don't, if anybody from work ever listened to this, not that I don't love all my clients, but you know, sometimes there are clients that I'm, I'm less excited to meet with. And I don't want that, you know, being the thing that's showing on my lock screen for the whole weekend is that I have that meeting coming up on Monday morning. I'd rather not think about that. And so just the ability to tie that all together with focus modes and, and the way that it makes it so much easier than the built-in calendar app sold me on the su- subscription and so I, I think, it, and you can also purchase that not through the app store as well. So that might be another way to, to gift it. You can purchase it directly from the developer FlexiBits. So fantastic, Cal. Their current subscription, I'll add, includes a bunch of other great things, like something that is, is a little bit like Calendly's scheduling features where you, you can book times and propose new times. And now that they have brought their Contacts app into the subscription, you can also get, so their Contacts app is called Card Hop. And so if you want a nicer way to manage your contacts than the thing that is presented to you by the Apple Contacts app, which is basically any other way you could manage your contacts, <laughs> this is a very good one. And it's included with your with your Fantastic L Flexibit subscription. It's that it's that Calendly feature they added last year that is like the reason why I sell people on this yeah. subscription now. Yeah, absolutely, have, and it's not cheaper to use, than Calendly. Right? Yeah, not having to use or and you don't have to use a second thing. I, whenever a student, a private student of mine, needs to make up a lesson, I have three URLs that link to templates depending on their lesson time: 30, 45, oh, or sixty so minutes. Smart. Yeah, and I just send them the I'm link. Start doing that. Yeah, it's really great. It's really great. It, it just looks through. I've you know customized like when I'm fr- like what windows of time I'm free. And then it is, of course, because it's all inside of the Fantastical app, it knows when my events are and does not present those right. as available times. That's smart. I have I have spent money. I've officially, I just did the Apple all Pay right. All right. on AirBuddy. It's done. And it's uh, now installed on my Mac. Wow. Okay. Let's see how long the rest of us last. We're moving on to services now. And I thought everyone was going to do like nerdy tech stuff, but I'm glad to see some coffee right here at the top. Craig, do you want to talk about trade coffee? Yes. So 
two years ago, my wife and I moved from Nashville, Tennessee, down to Auburn, Alabama. And Auburn, despite having a large university here, is a very small town outside of the university. And in Nashville, local coffee roasters would have their coffee inside a Kroger. And so we could easily get freshly roasted coffee from a local place inside a Kroger. They'd worked out deals. And so that's how we got our good coffee. But then we move here and that is not the case. And so I was like, I, we care too much about good coffee in our house to just get the junk that comes at, at Kroger here. And so I was talking to somebody and they recommended trade coffee and we've had a subscription for two years now. And we spend probably, it, we spend way too much on coffee, but it's one of those things that like for my wife and I, like I have a Kim X, I have a Kalita Wave to do pour overs. I have an AeroPress that I travel with. So coffee is a big deal in our house. So trade coffee, you tell this service your coffee preferences and then they send you you know, one to two bags a week or every other week or once a month, however often you want to do it, they'll send you coffee that matches your preferences from roasters all over the country. And um, it makes a great gift too. Again, I guess I'm just considering Robbie, your audience, my dad, because I've done this for my dad and his wife as well. And I did like a three month thing and they got to fill out, even as a gift, they got to fill out a survey of what they like. And then once a month, they got a bag of coffee. So I, it's cool because they can, the, the recipient of your gift can personalize it and, and really kind of hone in what they like or learn what they like. That's another really cool thing is you can go back later and go, you know, I've kind of learned this isn't my thing and even talk to them and the experts there and, and kind of hone what you like. So we, we get a couple bags a week from trade and go through it between my wife and I. It's fantastic. That's great. I, so I will also add that this one of the things that makes this a great gift, sometimes if you buy somebody a subscription as a gift and they already have a subscription to that, it's a real pain in the butt for them to f like figure out how to manage the thing that you got them as, as a nice gift and essentially you've now given them a chore. I got my brother trade coffee as a Christmas gift last Christmas and he, turns out, had recently already started a trade coffee subscription because he's a big coffee nerd. And basically, it worked like a gift certificate. Like, he just applied it, and it just went into his account, and he just didn't pay for the, the months that I had bought him as a gift. And so it's a, it's a really nice thing. Even if you think there's a chance or even know that the person you're giving this, this delightful coffee gift to has a trade subscription already... This is a really good one to, to work with because they've they've got it figured out on the back end. I just wanted to throw in that I we are yes please subscribers and it's really a similar deal. It's got some different some different focuses. Focus it focus what am I trying to say? Foci. Here? Foci. But that was <laughs> You could say focuses, <laughs> otherwise you sound like a jerk. It's like this is like people can say that say concerti and tempi. Oh right, if right. If you say right, concerti yeah. and tempi, you're just being a jerk. Like nobody yeah, no, nobody does stop. that. No, 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 but it's not no, it's not even I don't even say the focus is different. It's basically the similar concept of like we're gonna ship it to your house within a certain number of days. But you know, I yes please was like it's the same people who used to have Tonks coffee, which was like a single origin coffee mm. that they would source every couple of weeks and then like roast and ship to your house within like days of the roasting happening. So it's not as much variety because they're sort of like curating what coffee comes to you every week. And now, yes, please, the, you know, their current company is really similar. I actually think they just recently added, for a while it wasn't, they didn't have a single origin. They would just kind of like do a different blend every two weeks oh, to cool. your house. But now I think they've added back the single origin because Donk's coffee got bought by Blue Bottle. And I think Blue Bottle used right. them as sort of like their, what do you, what's the, what am I trying to say here? Like, uh, you know, sort of, thank you. That's kind of like their distribution became the basis of Blue, Blue Bottle's like online sales. So it's nice to see mm. Yes Please has the single origin thing back. And they have cool merch. Their mascot is like a multi armed dog that, like, on the t shirt is holding different like brewing methods in each arm. All right, I'm in. All right. Oh, we've got some health related stuff coming up. Would you like me to go? go yeah, first I on think that? so. Yeah. Sure. So I'm kind of stealing from your next two by combining them into one service. So, haha. -ha. Ah. I, I put in Apple Fitness Plus, and you know, I actually for a while at, I you know, I don't want to say we're done with the pandemic, but I guess. Back during peak COVID, I guess is how we talk about it now. I don't know. Sure. This is all I did. It, you know, I worked out in my garage with Fitness Plus and it was great. You know, 
my Apple Watch connected to the Apple TV and showed my rings and showed my heart rate and all that stuff right on the screen. I loved it. And then they've also, you know, I have since started going back to an actual gym. And so I don't do this as often, but it's still great. Like if I'm in a hotel room or something and, you know, the, the hotel has just an awful gym and there's nothing I can really do, I can at least do some body weight things in, in my room with Apple Fitness Plus. It's available and it's cheap enough that I don't feel bad keeping it, especially because I have the Apple One Bundle that has everything. But then they've also got some meditation in there and I've used that. And honestly, like I am not the, the biggest meditator. I'd like to do it more. I'm just, I don't know. I don't prioritize it. But to me, it was just as effective as Headspace was when I was subscribing to that. And I already pay for Apple Fitness Plus. So to have the mindfulness component and the fitness piece in one, I think it, it kind of makes a great gift. Granted, you might not want to say to folks, hey, you need fitness. That might not be a great gift, but this is stuff we like. So I like this. Yeah, fair fair enough. I, and I actually, I think I'm we're in a pattern here because you're recommending a cool thing and then I'm just recommending another option for that cool thing. But we're like really into the Peloton ecosystem here. And I know everyone thinks that Peloton is like a hardware company, but actually Peloton has a service that is just on demand classes through your phone. And the reason I put Peloton and Headspace in here is because they actually have educator pricing. Headspace is free, as is the Calm app, which is another like sort of service for, you know, just that it focuses all on meditation. Both are free for educators. And Peloton has a very generous pricing for there's, I think, a service, a couple, a couple of categories that Peloton will basically like discount the service. And I just, you know, for me personally, like I like really like the on demand content. I think it's it's really there's a lot of it. It's really well put together. Peloton it's, has has quite a lot of variety and because we are using doing like kind of a variety of different workouts as as you know if you're using Apple Fitness Plus, Apple gives you lots of achievements and Peloton also has its own achievement system which of course because the all of my Peloton minutes sync to my Apple Watch, I always get Apple credit for my Peloton workouts, mm. but not the other way around. And I'm really working on this. They have an annual achievement that basically just counts every minute you worked out for the whole year. And I'm like, there's no way I'm working out outside of this app at this point. <laughs> like if I'm going for a walk, I got the Peloton app running in my phone in my pocket. It's going to happen. So there you go. That's, good. That's good. And I'll, I'll second the the recommendations for, for Apple Fitness Plus, Peloton, and Headspace. I've used all of them at different times, and I, and I think they're all really good. They all have different things going for them. The, the, the last thing that I will recommend here is another service that I've started using somewhat recently, and that is Duolingo Family. So Duolingo, the language learning app, I don't think is a great way to learn a language from scratch, but I do find find it to be a really nice way of keeping me accountable for thinking in a, a language that I'm learning on a daily basis because of, it's, it's similar to Peloton and, and Apple Fitness Plus and Headspace. They have, you know, they, they encourage you to keep a streak going and they encourage some kind of mild light competition with friends and, and, and family. And so that's a nice thing. I learned Italian back in my undergraduate studies you know, 20 years ago. And I went to Italy last summer, so earlier this year. And this was a nice way for me to get back into it. And I got really excited about kind of getting more comfortable with Italian again. And so I've been doing Duolingo and my parents who are retired, have, they've always traveled a lot, but they've been traveling a lot more since they retired a lot to Europe. And so they've both kind of been picking up Duolingo as well. And so I, we, we went ahead and got Duolingo family. One of the cool things about the way this is set up is unlike something like Apple family sharing, where you really have to, like that's a pretty big commitment to, to, to join an Apple ID family, and that includes a lot of different things. Duolingo doesn't seem to care very much how like actual family you are with the people that are in your Duolingo family. So it's basically any five people that you that you like. So if you have some friends that you travel with or that you're just you know curious learners with, you could do a Duolingo family subscription and get all of them into into that. So I think that's a really, really fun way to, to keep learning things and, and be creative and, and try new things. You're, you're hit, this, uh, this, is, this is so cool. This is the first I've been very tempted. It's, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah. All right. I've got the page open. 
Right. It's between uh, you and me, Burns. Just the, just the page is open for now. I love this idea. I've, I've, you know, I have family in Mexico, and I've never felt like my Duolingo efforts have made me super comfortable speaking in Spanish. But I, you know, mm-hmm. I, th- it strikes me like I have a lot of students who speak Korean at my school, mm. and it seems like it would be kind of like just a way to, you know, show that I, you know care about who they are to just like because it's funny we have a lot of in my area we have a lot of variety of like restaurants you can eat at and like one of my favorite places to go is the korean barbecue place and it's just fun because like some of the i've been there yeah yeah you have been there shin chan which actually if any of my students somehow get a hold of this i'm probably still saying it wrong but i was really wrong the last time i mentioned it because i saw one of my students there and then i followed up in band class the next day and i was like oh my gosh what is your favorite thing to eat and they were like my your pronunciation of this restaurant is terrible and uh, I don't know, it'd be fun. It'd probably be fun to learn some, like get better at my Korean pronunciation so that, you know, the market near. It was, it was delicious. I, my, I, I haven't been to Robbie's studio, but I was passing through Baltimore very briefly and had time for dinner. And I said, Robbie, take me somewhere cool. And, uh, and we went there and I am a weakling when it comes to spice. So it was a little bit overwhelming in terms of that, but it was still delicious. I, I enjoyed it even if I had to drink quite a bit of Sprite or some other things to, to keep myself cool. We all Sorry, we got there. sidetracked. It's all good. It's all good. You have actually both been in my area very recently, which is cool. David and I grilled when he was here. But next time, David, I'll take you to the Korean barbecue spot because it is... You got to come up with some cool conference that I need to go to again. Yeah, I know. Hey, does that one that you came to happen annually? That was the first one, and I think the next one is probably going to be somewhere else. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, we're all the way to the part of the outline where we talk about hardware and gadgets. And this is the most dangerous part of the outline. It sure is. Sure is. Craig, are you the Apple MagSafe battery pack? I am. This is, I feel like this got a bad rap when it came out because, I mean, there are other MagSafe battery packs that are less expensive, but this one's just good. And like, I, I keep it in my backpack or in a, in a bag. And I mean, granted my battery life is a lot better now that I've upgraded my phone recently instead of it being a couple years old. But even just like, you know, I, I travel for work a fair amount now and just knowing that I've got that safety net there and that it just can attach via MagSafe to my phone is so nice. And being able to kind of it integrate with Apple's battery widgets and all those things. And it's one of those things that unless you're probably one of us on this podcast because it is a hundred bucks you might not buy it for yourself but it's a good thing to like add to a gift list or something so you know it's it's simple in what it does but man it just every time i have it and i use it i'm like i'm so glad that i bought this so i also have always found really tempting i only feel like i need backup battery capacity maybe once or twice a year so i've never i've never gone in on it but it, it, i agree for for all the ways that it integrates with the operating system and the battery widget and stuff like that it's definitely a, 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 good, a good option i have it i love it and, for all of all of those same reasons and i'm an upgrade my phone every two years guy and so by i i have the 14 by the end of the 12's life, it was not getting good battery life at all. Mm. I was not, I was almost not making it through the day. So even just having that, ha- I used it a lot around the end of uh, the 12 cycle. All right. Did I put AirPods I on here? AirPods in here. Oh, I, don't I know. guess the, maybe. I don't I know. Air, put them there. AirPods are good. I, I like mine a lot. They're so um, good. I think You're we really did this going one. out on a limb there, Robbie. <laughs> I like them. Hot take. My, AirPods my favorite. Okay. My favorite pair of AirPods is still the twos, which I believe you can still buy. They're probably the cheapest ones you can buy. The threes, I do have a pair of threes. They fit my ears better than the pros, which don't stay in my ears. But they, like they, you know, they are not as good as the twos. One of these days, I'm just gonna have to buy all of the AirPod Pro twos that are left. When you know, like when they go out of, you know, out of sale, out of sale. When they're no, when they're their you know, demise seems like it's it's coming. But I like the threes. I did actually try a pair of AirPod Pro 2s for like a week just to see if they would fit my ears better than the previous ones. They don't. They have really nice. Yeah, they have really nice features though. I really like, I don't really need the noise canceling stuff from the AirPod Pros, but I do like that they have cool features. I loved the like uh, turning the volume up and down from the stem of the 
thing and uh, you know they were they were really nice but they just they just weren't staying in so i returned them but uh yeah airpods what else is there to say they're great i i have airpods pro 2 and i love them i love the new ability to charge on both magsafe and apple watch chargers because i've got little charger things at all of the desks that i sit at during the day so that's really nice and i i will say i have replaced the ear tips that they come with with a, a pair of ear tips that are memory foam coated in silicone. So they have the surface feel of the factory ear tips that they come with, but they seal a little bit better because of the memory foam beneath that. And I really like that system a lot. If we're all- the, the other thing is you don't have to replace them as often. So I had regular memory foam ear tips on my, on my other ones, and I still use memory foam ear tips for my Sure in your monitors and they have to, I have to replace them every month or two because they get super gross and they start to fall apart. But these have been ticking for a while now and the silicone coating means they don't get as gross. So hopefully that means that I won't have to replace them as often. If we're all sharing what AirPods we have, I have AirPod Pro ones and I would like to, I need to upgrade to the, need is a strong word. I would very much like to upgrade most and the feature that I'm most excited about is the Find My integration. Mm, the mm -hmm. Pro Ones do sort of work with Find My, but they don't have the U1 chip. And again, I work from my house and I have three small children. I the chances of me losing them, it's multiple times a week, and it's a pain to find them. That alone would save me a lot of frustration and heartache. So I I would like to upgrade mine here pretty soon all right let me just say that i like kindles are you all i i, I, I the ipad is is obviously you know a more versatile device i love to you know like read web stuff on my ipad and i love to i love to read on my ipad but i love the distraction free aspect of using the kindle i have a kindle paperwhite that's like 11 or 12 years old that i still use almost every day and they still make the paperweight. It's the same design. It's just, it's probably just, it's nicer now if you go and you buy one. I'm, it has, I've looked at it recently. It's got newer features. It's, I think, like more water resistant. It's water it has, resistant now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure so it's way in the bathtub. Right. I, well, I do that kind of reckless stuff even with mine and it's still going strong. But I don't know. I, there's lots of fancier Kindles out there. I mean, if someone really wants to buy a Kindle or buy someone a Kindle, the Paperwhite is to me just like the best manifestation of that idea. I'm not like into the, the physical buttons. I've never really ha had access to them for long. Maybe I would be if I did, but I don't know. I think just find like the really simple, symmetrical, light Kindle Paperwhite works for me. I, I've had a Paperwhite since 2014 and I actually had one a little before that that was stolen in a backpack that was stolen. And so I'm sure that one would be still going fine, but mine from 2014 works perfectly well. So, I mean, for the price that they are, they last forever as well. So they're fantastic. Nice. You want to talk about, you kind of can't cut Stream Deck because you no, already, I, I did. You I already entered foreshadowed it. it. Yeah, I know. And we talked about it last year, but I mean, it's, it's just such a cool device. Like uh, a Stream Deck is a, so it's like a little hardware device that you plug into your computer that has a grid of, you know, buttons that light up and you customize what the buttons do and what the buttons look like. And the buttons can do lots of different things. They can run keyboard shortcuts. They can change. Like if you do any streaming, you can change which one of your cameras is the you know the one that the people on the receiving end of the stream can see something that i do is i have siri shortcuts programmed to some of the buttons that have to do like that mine is in my studio and so like one of the things i do is i let my students in and out of the door which is like up some stairs so like i have a siri shortcut that oh, unlocks and locks the door for them i have one that shows me my camera in the apple home app to see like if someone's at that door. I have one, sometimes they don't like shut the door all the way. So I have one that just checks if the door is shut all the way and then tells me on my computer. And then I've got some, just like a, some that just bring certain apps to the foreground that I use quite a lot. It's just a really versatile device and the, the actions are, are very highly customizable. I don't know, oh, and there's other, so there like are people who can custom make profiles. You, you yourself as a user of one can make a profile, but there are people who like make and sell really good profiles that are like tailored to specific workflows or even applications. David, would you know any good 
profiles that a music educator yeah. might want to use on a stream deck? I mean, no, nothing that springs immediately to mind. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, so I developed a, a Stream Deck plugin and corresponding profile along with Phil Brothman that you can get at notationcentral.com that is for Dorico. It's called Notation Express. And it is super, super handy and it connects directly to Dorico and can do all sorts of things that you really even have a hard time doing with keyboard shortcuts in Dorico. And there are lots of things like that. So there's, you can find ways that connect to Zoom if you do Zoom a lot that will you know, have a, a hardware mute button for your, for your microphone and camera on Zoom, which is pretty great. And it will even show you the status of your microphone and camera right there on that mute button. So that's pretty cool because because the button is a screen, it can show you the current state of something as well. So yeah, highly recommend the Stream Deck. I've got an XL here. I don't know what, what you're rocking, Robbie. I have the medium one. I, I don't think I'm at a point in my life where I really am gonna become more of a power user of the Stream Deck than I already am, but uh, I do, like, in a tiny way, um, regret not getting the bigger one. The day I decided I needed it, I needed it that day, and it was the one they had in stock at my local Best Buy. <laughs> so I'm so glad that it was, because it was great. It's, it's, I, I really dig it. I, th I feel like I would be cramped by, by the 15-key stream deck. I'm going to delete this next one also, in the interest of time. Okay. We can delete my, my light bulbs, too. Those uh, are pretty fun. Yeah. They are fun, but they don't have matter yet. I'll, we'll put them back next year. Okay. They're going to have to do an update because the hardware doesn't support, which is fine. It's still it's very fast and works with HomeKit. Anyway, so I've got a, a couple of, of small gadgets that I want to recommend. One is a, a new-ish product from Anchor that is, so Anchor, A-N-K-E-R, makes a lot of useful power and cables and things for your, your devices, both your big devices and your small devices. And this is a new device that is a combination power supply and battery pack, battery backup. So it is a power supply that you can plug into the wall and it has a USB-A and two USB-C ports that you can use to charge your devices. But then when you're done charging your devices and you pack everything up and go, it can also serve as a backup battery if you need it in a pinch. So that's a really cool thing to to have around. And, you know, it's got enough juice to to, to charge your iPhone a couple of times and, and, and top you off on an iPad or maybe even a MacBook Pro. I haven't tried it as a battery, battery backup for my MacBook Pro. It would probably just maybe drain more slowly because I don't think it's going to deliver power that quickly. But it's a really, really handy little thing that I'm going to be traveling later this week, and I'm excited to have that extra little juice. And then the last thing that I want to add is a webcam. This is the webcam that I'm, I'm, I'm using on this Zoom call. Listeners won't, won't know this, but it is from Insta360, which is a company that mostly is known for making 360 action cameras, but they made a webcam recently, and it has a gimbal, and it can do all kinds of, it's got all kinds of really great features. And one of them is that it will like follow you. So if you move on, and, and the, there's some built-in features now in my Apple Studio display and in my iPad mini that do this sort of just by cropping the image and zooming in in different ways. This actually like moves a robot. To follow me when I move and so that's pretty cool and I can have it point down at my desk so like if my cat comes up and sits on my desk and I want to show it in a zoom call I can just like click a button and I have this preset to show my desktop and then I can click another button and go back to my face and it's doing it all robotically which is great and you can zoom in there's little markers that you can use to like focus on a whiteboard if you want and you can tell it, hey, don't focus on me, follow the whiteboard. It has a lot of really great features. I've been using it for a few months. It replaced a, another fancy webcam that I bought from a startup company that will remain nameless. And I'm, I'm, I've not been super impressed by the, that, that webcam startup. I still have the camera. It's still going fine, but it's it's way, way less cool than the InstaLink 360 or Insta360 Link. It costs the same, and it's from a company that is more capable of supporting it through software. So highly recommend this camera. It's more expensive than most webcams, but it's way less expensive than something like, like Robbie's fancy DSLR setup. If you, if you are a person that uses like a real camera and a capture card or something like that, this is not going to compete with that either in quality or price, but it's way better 
than the the webcam that's built into your computer or your monitor and it's it's really a lot better even than most external webcams as well i like it a lot this is really cool i i mean i've been wondering i've, I've watched it follow you around as we've been on this call and was curious what you were using because it's definitely better than center stage apple's built in thing so I, I knew that you weren't using that but I, I wasn't sure it looks fantastic yeah it's it's literally moving like there, there's there's it, it's, oh you tried to show it off oh, now it's it gonna off. mess it up oh, okay <laughs> so it's it's got a it's got an ai thing if you hold up your hand it will turn it on and off Whoa. but if i'm talking with my hands sometimes it will see that so now it's just stopped it's got a little light that tells you it recognized a gesture so now it's not doing it but if i do this again now it'll start doing it again it's pretty fast. It's pretty reliable. So this, <laughs> anyway, it's really cool. <laughs> for for those listening to the podcast, David was just moving all around his room. It was fantastic. I'm really oh, jealous. Man. There's no way I'm buying one. There's no way I'm buying one. But I just really, when you got there's that. A, uh, there's a great, if you, if you subscribe to um, Stancy Labs, Quinn Nelson's YouTube channel, he did a really good extended review. It was sponsored, so take it with a grain of salt. But he did a really long video about this that's, that's very good. Yeah, I watched that. All right, Robbie, are you ready to turn me loose? Is, is, is this Uh-oh. why you brought me here? I need yeah. to stretch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, I think like bags, pens, there's, there's like lots of things out there that because I'm such a software nerd, I just, they're like basic everyday things that I think regular people probably care about. And, and I don't know. So I'm just sleeping on them. And like you've awakened me to, hey, all that nice stuff that you like. The coffee, the software, the computing devices. Well, what if you could have nice pens and bags? That's kind of like, Craig, what I owe to you over the past year. So I thought maybe you could tell us some of your favorite pens, stationary, bag. Yeah. So I've included in our document a few great beginner things that are just absolutely fantastic because I could get way more expensive and way crazier really fast, especially in the pen department. Just ask my wife. But if you ever want a good like understanding of fountain pens, um, the Pen Attic podcast, they're now in the 500s in terms of episodes. But back, and it was like right pre-COVID, they did episode 400 and they made that like Pen Addict 101. And they explain a lot of terminology and different things. And it's, you know, a really good episode just to learn about pens. I will not get that deep now, but I have, that kind of started me, especially when COVID hit and I was trying to find some joy in the world. I was like, you know, I've always kind of liked writing instruments. Let's, let's buy a fountain pen and just see. And I kid you not, every time I'm writing with one now, there's just this little moment of like, <laughs> this is nice. I like this. And so I've, I've gone way too deep, but my recommendation for best starter fountain pen that's also a good gift is the Pilot Metropolitan. Now, Robbie, I had you get this pen. It, it was one of your first two. How, how did that treat you? Yeah, this is a, a good pen. It's got a nice feel. Some of the pens that I started with had, and that I think are recommended both by you and also I did listen to that like starter pen addict episode they have a good blog post did you i don't know if you said this a couple seconds ago but they have a good like po- like you know if you want to would rather just read it a good blog post yeah. of some of their favorite materials and this what i liked about this one was that it's like is i guess so what i say symmetrical like it doesn't have like a little like kind of like a thumb grip on it it's just like the same on all it's yeah. a circle on all sides which is not the case yeah so it depends yeah, the, the Lamy that you mentioned you have has kind of a triangular grip because it's made to kind of teach students how to hold a pen. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I don't always recommend that for f- people's first fountain pen because some people don't like that that grip. But to me, the Pilot Metropolitan is, it's just a classy looking pen. And so, and it's 20 bucks. And so, you know, you can definitely get more expensive pens, or, you know, you can get a $5 starter fountain pen that actually is pretty great, but it it looks cheap. This is one that like looks classy when you're giving somebody a gift. Now, in terms of inking things, people can get a little overwhelmed. So what I've done is I've included an ink option in this document. You can have bottles of ink and have tools that pull the ink up into the pen 
that is not that I don't recommend that as a starter, but you can also just buy ink cartridges that are just little plastic things that you pop into the pen. And when you pop it in, it punk the pen punctures it and then the ink flows through. And so pilots cartridges are proprietary. You have to buy pilot ink cartridges to work with pilot pens. So I've included one of my favorite pilot inks. And to me, that pen and ink combination, like when I see it on a page, is one of the things that just brings me delight because some of the things that you can do with fountain pen ink and the colors and the just properties of it and how it looks just really make me happy. And so that's probably, that ink is one of my all time favorites. I have it in my nicest, most expensive pen. I, I keep that one always inked up. And so they also make it in a, in a cartridge format. So I put those in the document. So it is Pilot Hiroshizuku Shinkai, which is Japanese for deep sea. It's a bluish blackish gray color it's beautiful and then to kind of round out my my fountain pen 101 i put a a great fountain pen paper you can i mean i signed some of my daughter's field trip permission slips with a nice fountain pen earlier and it was fine but there are papers that are made to kind of bring out some of those properties there you go i see dr david has a rhodia pad i, I love a rhodia pad <laughs> but go ahead I'll, I'll let you continue so, Rhodia, let you finish. Rhodia is a it's a thicker paper, and it's also coated in a way that it it takes fountain pen ink really well, and it's also not super expensive. You could use it for writing with things that are not fountain pens. So recommend when I'm getting people started. I told Robbie to buy one. Again, going back to my dad, I have bought him a Pilot Metropolitan and and a Rhodia pad. So definitely, I actually a have paper. a an Amazon subscribe and save where I get. A, an A5 dot grid Rhodia pad delivered to me once a quarter. And I just have them distributed throughout my, my home and, and workplaces so that I always have a nice place to, to write down a, a quick note. And I, I like the A5 size, which yeah. is like a, like a, I don't know, it's about a, around the size of like a five by seven photo print. If you if, it, if that's a, a, a size that means something to you, it's a, it's a nice good size for making quick notes, but also making quick sketches. And I like a nice dot grid and I am not a fountain pen nerd. So this is like me going to a, a, a a club of people who roast their own coffees and telling them all about my favorite K cups for my Keurig at home. But I, I really like the, the Uniball jet stream gel pen. Solid is a, choice. Is a amazing jet, amazing gel pen for, for those of you that have, have, have had enough blobby pilot G twos in, in, in your life. The, the Uniball jet stream is a good way to go. If you need a good, gel ink pen the uniball signo dx is also yes. fire yes that's that pen is the first pen i ever had that was on nicer than a bic pen and i love it in fact i think like if people don't like just want something a little nicer than you know just using whatever pen they found on the floor of their classroom you know those <laughs> gel pens are like really really decent and a delight to write with and they don't have any of the fuss of some of the fountain pens like right, you don't right. have to deal with the ink i really really recommend them a lot i keep one of those and i keep one of is it is it pronounced lamy i thought it was lamy mm -hmm. but lamy i have my lamy safari and the signa in you know kind of like just in my little pen area of my backpack and i just like i don't know i just like having those options with me everywhere they fit right into the little, the little pen slots of my pen pouch if i wanted to go like if, if the safari is what is resonating with me the most, but I wanted something mm -hmm. a little nicer. Where do I go? Lamy makes a, a similar pen. It is the exact same shape, but it's made of aluminum. It's called the All Star, but it's AL Star. I know this is not great for your listeners, but here's a, a Lamy All Star. You can see it is the same pen, but it is aluminum. So it, it kind of has that a little nicer, more professional feel than the plastic of the Safari. So that might be where I would go. Do they have anything that's pretty similar to that, but that does not have that grip shape I was mentioning earlier? They do. Lamy makes a lot of great stuff. I honestly don't have them. I've got two Safaris and two All-Stars. So the Lamy Aeon, I think is one that looks, to me, looks really cool. And it's got the same nib, which the nib is the piece that you actually touches the paper that you write with it's a, it's you know the same quality and so that might be a, that's kind of a cool like more modern looking pen but 
I'll think about that. I've, I I might have some other ideas for you. Yeah, and I do really like that Rodia notepad. I have one of those also that's just permanently in my bag. It's just great for like yeah. jotting down all the chaotic things that come into my brain throughout the day that don't, definitely do not need to be saved into yeah. any kind of digital system permanently. Yeah. And it makes me so, writing having a nice pen makes me write slower, which I know that like teaching as an example is like a frantic job but like you don't have to go so fast i'm learning it's taken me a very long time in my career to know to figure this out finally but you just don't have to go so fast like it's fine to take a moment and like write that late pass for your student a little slower enjoy the feeling of the ink yeah I, that really is is what it's all about to me so tying that in this this may be a little too much and if you want to cut all this go for it but I have gone off the deep end with my my planner that I'm going to be using for 2023. And I've already started because it was so nice. And I I ordered it to have it for 2023. And then I couldn't stop myself. I have joined the plotter bandwagon. And in the, the fountain pen community, it's the new hot thing. And I have the A5 sized plotter going back to what David said. And another reference, by the way, for the A5 would be like your standard moleskin notebook that yeah. that would be a five size so a plotter is a leather ringed notebook and because it is ringed it's modular and so they have all sorts of different papers they have task list papers that's kind of like project management and you can mark the different tasks are 25 50 75 percent 100 percent complete they have lined they have dot grid they have a four sized which is double the size of an a5 that can be folded to fit inside the A4. And then they also have like small little note cards. So I keep some of these around with me at all times. And I'll quickly jot a note down even on a note card and either put it in the right section of my notebook or throw it away if it's not something urgent. But I kind of get it down slowly and, and have that down. Mm -hmm. And then one of my favorite things about them are they have individual folders that can go inside and keep different loose papers organized. They call them project managers. And I know that I'm not a teacher in a classroom anymore. It's been a few years now, but to me, this would be great for like unit plans and to have individual pages for your lesson plans. If you wanted to kind of write those out, because then they also have a storage thing that you can buy to keep all your pages for the year together in a, in a storage box that's designed for that. So you could then pull that back out for the next year and reference it. So the, the paper is fountain pen friendly. It is it just every time I pull this out of my bag and because it's leather, like I've only had this a month or so and it's already starting to kind of have a little bit of wear from my bag, but in a nice way. And I just, I get so much joy. I manage everything. I don't use a task manager anymore. I, listeners of the class nerd would be shocked to hear that, but I keep everything. It's kind of a makeshift bullet journal, but not like hashtag Bujo on Instagram that has to like be super attractive. It's very practical, but it kind of, I combine some mindfulness, you know, writing about how not just this happened, but how did I feel in that moment? So I could reference back along with what I need to do. And man, I just cannot tell you how much I'm enjoying this and the leather. I will be honest. The leather binders are very expensive for a leather binder. I mean, it's leather. It is very nice leather. So, but you can, if you want to try it out, you can, but the inserts are very reasonably priced. You know, generally for like 80 pages, it's $8 or something like that. So, you know, it's, it's very, re so I really recommend trying that out. And then, so that's what I did. I kind of bought a few, they, they come in different sizes. I bought a few different sized inserts and then tried to figure out which one I wanted to use long-term and then bought the leather binder. So I, it's it's a very niche kind of thing, but man, is it making me happy right now. Nice, love it. I'll just throw onto this this conversation just to kind of transition to the bag thing that you have, in addition to being a, a, some pen inspiration in my life, you also helped me work through buying a new backpack at the start of this past school year. And I had like a whole group of tabs in my web browser just with like maybe about six or seven different Tom Bin bags open. And I was furiously researching them and like reading everything I could about them. I ultimately landed on two bags, which was my intent. And I thought I would share the two because they have a variety of very excellently crafted bags. I landed on the Paragon, which is like my daily backpack now. And it's just like one big middle area with a laptop insert 
like little protection sleeve that's big enough for my 14 inch macbook pro and my 12.9 inch ipad pro and then one outside pocket for like some small stuff and accessories and i just stuffed this thing with stuff like it's got my macbook my ipad pro there's a great accessory they make called the freudian slip which lets you stick some pens and i know actually my rhodia notebook my pens previously mentioned and my apple pencil all just are in that slip and then the slip can pull, be just kind of like yanked right out and fits exactly into my other bag I bought, which is a medium cafe bag, which if I'm just like kind of hanging around doing errands on a Saturday, I just kind of sling it over my shoulder. It's great for just shoving an iPad and a Kindle and maybe a pen in. I really, I really like these two bags a lot. They're so well made. I just feel like I'm going to have them for a really long time. And they're like way lighter than any other backpacks. Like I've had some other backpacks that are like similar in the sort of design layout, but nothing that feels as light and as durable. So I really dig them. They also make tons of great accessories, like little dongle bags. And like I got one for like some of my cards and my passport. Just really, really well made stuff. The Paragon mm-hmm. is probably my favorite Tom Bin bag. I'm, it's unfortunate my company just upgraded me to a 16 inch laptop and it doesn't quite, it almost fits, but I'm afraid. And so I haven't been carrying it. I've been carrying one of my other Tom Bin bags that has more room for a 16 inch laptop. But I think in my heart, the Paragon is my favorite. The straps on that one are some of the best straps they make. It's just phenomenal. I love that bag. I really like the look of these cafe bags. I might, I'm not, I'm not ready to, to, to jump in on one yet. I need to do some more research on the exact size of them. But sometimes I do just like really want to bring just a small iPad and go to a cafe and work for a little while. And that seems like a good a good fit for that kind of situation. I've got one that's really small that I, I, I had like custom made by an Etsy person when I got my first 9.7 inch iPad and it's great, but it doesn't, it's not a great fit for, for my modern iPads. And so these are looking, these are looking pretty slick. They're real nice. I wanted to get the small one, but the reason I went medium and I don't think the medium is ridiculously large, but the medium is just big enough to put a 12.9 inch iPad pro in. Right. And that's what I want. And yeah. and I actually so I'll, I'll mention my my backpack which I also got pretty recently is the Peak Design Everyday bag and and that's a really nice backpack. They make mostly photography accessories and things like that, and so they intend that this is a bag that could double as a a, a camera bag. I'm not a camera nerd. I don't have that kind of gear, but it's really nice. It's really modular. You can access from the sides or from the top anything. So if you've got heavy stuff that you keep down at the bottom separate from your main backpack compartment, you can get to that really easily. And it's really like flexible and modular and they make a bunch of accessories that work with it. And I, I like that. I, I like that a lot. And it's it's a different look than the Tom Bin bags, though maybe not as different if you get the same colors than, than, than I might've imagined, but it's definitely a distinctive look and I've been rocking it for a little while. Similarly, it has a laptop sleeve that is just big enough for my, my 13 inch MacBook Pro and my 13 inch iPad. And if there's a new iPad that's bigger than the 12.9, 13-inch iPad right now, I pretty much need it because I'm broken on the inside, <laughs> and I would have to get a new bag. Yeah. So I might have to. I might have to look into. There's a. I have the 20 liter version, which is the smaller of the two versions of the Peak Design Everyday bag. I might have to upgrade to the 30 liter version if I get if there's if there's any larger iPads in the future. And that really is I, the Paragon is I believe 19 liters if I'm remembering, which that's the kind of nerdy thing that I remember. Right. But it, for for folks listening who may not be able to grab the show notes immediately, I would say like the difference between these two. The Paragon's kind of going for like that vintage Jansport kind of vibe, just kind of right. the big open pocket, the one zipper across the front. The Peak Design, I mean, it's super cool, but it's kind of a more modern, sleek. It, I mean, right. it, it looks super cool. So yeah, they're they're both. It's it's good. I dig it. And and I also use a bag a, a bag inside the bag to organize cables and stuff that I like yeah. a lot. This is a really cheap little thing from from Amazon. A bag Smart Electronic Organizer, small travel cable organizer, bag for hard drives, cables, USB, SD card, gray. Is <laughs> it has a nice like <laughs> I love reading the the full keyword spam names of yeah. items on on Amazon. It's a nice kind of like folio size thing. It's actually kind of around the size of that A5 pad we've been talking about but about two or three times 
the thickness of that the, the the rhodia pad and it's got a nice way to organize cables and stuff and i have that around with me all the time and i always have the right lightning to whatever cable that i need and I, it's, it's it's just a nice thing to always have with me as i'm going around from classroom to classroom in different buildings on campus some of which were you know renovated last summer and some of which haven't been renovated since the reagan administration so it's nice to be able to have whatever i need in in whatever situation i i find myself in and to have that way of organizing it so that if somebody needs something i can just rip this one thing out of my backpack and say it's it's somewhere in here and and that's a really nice thing as well all right we made it through the gifts i'm proud of categories now it's the fun time yeah, we've got segments. We've it, got it only at, took us an hour and a half. You know what? And if and I and I purposefully, not knowing how fast we would be able to do it, I made my app pick of the week potentially controversial. So we'll just we'll just follow where we're, where we feel led. What time does your flight leave tomorrow? Oh, it's not early. I, I thought it was oh, okay. early, which is why I was originally saying I couldn't do tonight. But it's oh, okay. eleven thirty. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then let me tell you about my and, app and of the week. <laughs> I'm about a I'm about a ten minute drive from the airport, which is yeah. about as far as you can be from anything in Wichita. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, my app pick of the week. Oh, before I get it, get to this, actually, in passing, Craig mentioned something. He mentioned show notes. If you're listening to this and you don't already know this, I link everything that gets discussed on the show in the show notes. And your podcast player, most likely, if it is like a standardized podcast app, has some sort of place where you can swipe or scroll to see all the links that I've added. So if you want to actually just like easily find this stuff, click or tap around. Of course, you can go to RobbieBurns.com or music at techtalk.com where there is a complimentary blog post, which also has all these links. Okay. App of the week. I've been using a Twitter client called Spring, which is, um, it's an app. So a lot of, uh, a lot, so like lots of third party Twitter apps can do nice things. Like a, a lot of them sort of feel more like they belong on iOS or Mac OS, but third party Twitter clients have until more recently not had all of the features of Twitter. They still actually can't, but Twitter has been adding, you know, m- making more APIs available to third party developers to sort of get some of that stuff rolled back in. So my until recently I've been using Tweetbot, which I really like, and over the past couple of years has started to add back some of these features, but Spring has more of them. It it has all the great things that you would like out of a third party client. Like it shows you the tweets of the people you follow and the order that you follow them. It shows you no ads. It does not show you liked or favorited tweets by the people you follow. But Spring also takes advantage of some things that Tweetbot doesn't. Like it shows things sort of in their conversational context. Like you, like in Tweetbot, I would scroll and I would see somebody's reply to something like in backwards order because I'm scrolling chronologically through the timeline. Whereas Spring, right. well, like if somebody replies to someone else in my feed, it'll actually like show the tweet that they replied to in context of their tweet, which is just oh, one cool. of many nice things. Twitter is currently a service that I still use. So if you're... It, it remains a count that is in my 1Password. Yes. And while I'm using it, I'm going to try to find the best experience I can. And the best way I can find to use Twitter is to avoid all of the garbage. The thing, the, the, it, there's so much garbage out there. Like, it's nice to be able to like really curate your own situation, have a setup, you know, and kind of more finely tune what you actually see. Because a lot of these networks can be actually like a pretty nice place if you can customize it to your liking. Now, Twitter lately is really just only about itself. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know if there's any way to avoid that, but... In the meantime, there's Spring for for all of your power user iOS app nerd needs. So my app of the week, I, I actually I, I had a very difficult time deciding whether I wanted do to do space team, do space team, space team, app. space okay. team, space all team. Right. So Space Team. Uh, Space Team is a free game that is is this a thing that you should definitely get your family and and friends to download. And, and I've totally that played thing. this. I love this thing. I had forgotten about it. Oh, I'm so excited. It's been around for years. It has it has been continually updated. It actually got some updates over the pandemic to make it more easy to play remotely on, on a Zoom call, which is pretty fun. Its its tagline in the App Store is a collaborative shouting game, and I find that to be extremely descriptive. Basically, the the premise is everybody downloads this game, you all play it together, 
And it's the scene that happens in every science fiction space opera movie where, where the ship is going down and things are breaking left and right and there are people shouting commands at one another about things to fix and there's all kind of technical nonsense writing that happens. I imagine how fun it would be to be a writer in that writer's room making up all of the technical nonsense that they're shouting at one another. And that's essentially what this is. So each person gets something that's broken and how to fix it showing up in their screen. And somebody on the space team has the control that fixes that thing. And you don't know who it is. And so you just have to shout the instruction that's popping up on your screen. And so it's a bunch of people shouting really bizarre technical nonsense. And it's really fun. And yeah, it's, it's like I said, it's totally free. It runs on iOS and Android. So it, whatever devices you have available, you can, you know, have, if you've got an iPad and an iPhone and somebody in your you know group didn't bring their iPhone or their iPhone's dead, they can play it on an iPad. It's very, very fun. Highly recommend it. I actually had a couple of sessions of this with my composition studio at the end of last academic year to, to celebrate the, the, the return to campus and having successfully completed a year on, on campus again. And so it's really fun. Highly recommend. Space Team. I didn't mean to, to like tell you to not do clean shot, by the way. If you want to do clean shot, too, okay. be my guess. Well, I'll do clean shot, too. Clean shot is actually a useful application, and this is an application that runs on your, your Mac, and it essentially is a drop-in replacement for the built-in screenshot utility on Mac OS, and it brings in a lot of really great markup features that you can you can use. In, it, in some ways, if you ever used the, the, the old Evernote Sketch app where you would take a screenshot and draw stuff on it, draw arrows, circle things, Things. It's got a lot of those kinds of features. It also can do screen recordings, and it's not as robust as a screen recording tool as something like ScreenFlow, but it's really great and really simple and really fast. So one of the great benefits that it has that I think often gets left out is it has a web service. And so when you buy this app, or it's included in Setup, if you're a Setup subscriber, you can take a screenshot and it does the little thing just like on your phone or on a, a recent Mac operating system where a little thumbnail of that screenshot will hover in the bottom corner of your screen. You can open it up and edit it, but then there's a button to immediately copy that image to your clipboard, which is great. And with continuity clipboard, you can then paste it in a chat that you've got open on your iPhone or something. But also, there's a button to upload it to the cloud, and this is super useful with videos. So when I get a question from a student about or a colleague about how to do something on the university website or how to do something in Dorico or Sibelius or whatever, I will open Dorico or Sibelius or whatever, pop open a screen recording in CleanShot, do the thing. I will narrate myself doing the thing because it will record my voice as well. And then I will click the cloud button and then as it is uploading to the cloud, I'll start typing the email. And when it comes time for me to paste the link, it will have already finished the upload and put that link on my clipboard and I can just paste it and send it to them right away. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a it's, and it's a pretty nice little player. It's not as robust as something like YouTube, but it's really nice. And I use this all the time. So in a lesson, if a student's struggling with something, even if they're there to see me do it, I will screen record myself in CleanShot doing the same thing, and then I can send them a link so that when they get home and they're working out on their own, they can review exactly what we did together in the lesson. CleanShot so, clean is CleanShot X. It's so good. One of those apps that makes my when I don't have it installed, it it makes my Mac feel broken. Yep. So so good to use. And I'll, I'll, let me just throw in here for Space Team. On the topic of, do you want to give someone a gift that is a digital thing or a physical thing? The board, like board game, card game version of Space Team, is incredibly fun and is like a real like if you just don't know what to give someone, but you have people who like games of any kind. Actually, this is not even like a super nerdy board game. Like this is a, it's a party game because everyone's yelling at each right. other and having a good time. Space Team, like the actual physical box set card game, is was my introduction to the game and I immediately bought it the second I went home from playing it with some friends. It's very, very fun and makes a great gift. Amazing. My app is not a new app. I know it's one that Robbie has talked about many, many times on this show, but it had a killer update. I think just last week, um, Timery, the time tracking app that works with Toggle has been updated to include live activities, the new feature of iOS 16.1. And so now when you start a timer in the Timery app on your iPhone and then close it, it'll appear in the dynamic island if you have a 14 Pro. 
or, or Pro Max, or it'll appear and stay on the lock screen and always be showing you your timer. And I have always struggled with time tracking because I forget that I have a timer running and just never turn it off. And while that still happens to me occasionally because I still use Timery on my Mac or my watch or different areas, and you do have to kind of open up Timery on your phone and then close it to get the live activity going. So it happens to me occasionally, but it's a lot less, especially now having an always on lock screen. It to me has just revolutionized and I've actually been tracking my time lately. and It's been really valuable. So that's a, it's a great update to an already great app. That sounds amazing. Great app. Love it. Where are we? Album of the week. Which Album? What's your album? Well, I just wrote in the outline dancing music, but what that means is <laughs> anything that my almost three-year-old and I can agree on is good for me. And um, I'm a sucker for Carly Rae Jepsen. And she's got, oh, a, man. she's got a new record out. What is it actually called? I just... My son just says, dance, dance, dance. Dancing for him is like I just hold him and like move to the rhythm of the music. I think one of these songs this was... sounds like dancing to me. That's all dancing is to me too. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. Yeah, I feel like the second track off of this record was used in an Apple product video at some point. And that's the one that he wants to listen to all the time. The record is called The Loneliest Time. And Joshua Tree is his favorite track, track two. So if you want to, I'm really just recommending music that my child likes. But actually, it's pretty catchy music. It's the first record of hers that I felt like I want to listen to on repeat since Emotion from, you know, when did that come out? Like 2013 or 14? It's it's catchy. That sounds cool. My my album pick is not a, a, a new album at all. It's probably 15 20 years old by now. It is a album called Uncommon Ritual. I think it's usually marketed as an Edgar Meyer record, Edgar Meyer bass player, but it's Edgar Meyer on bass, Mike Marshall on mandolin and guitar, and Bale Fleck on banjo. It's just these guys kind of just having a great time. Some of the tracks are super chill. Some of the tracks are pretty, but it's just a really lovely chill album to, to listen to on, on a weekend or a lazy morning. I would I would like somebody to like I, I would love to find someone who doesn't like that record. I don't mean like somebody who hasn't I heard not, it before. That, that person's should. definitely a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed, oh, man. <laughs> it's it's great. So so if you like if you listen to this and you don't like it, don't don't add me. My album is by a group called Bonnie Light Horseman. They're kind of a super group, but of kind of obscure folk musicians uh anias mitchell is kind of the lead singer she's a uh singer songwriter she also wrote the musical hades town so she's a a brilliant singer songwriter and then it's her and two guys uh eric johnson and josh i'm gonna forget now but they uh they had a new album come out in the last month or so called rolling golden holy that's a hard name to say. And I do, I like their self titled debut album from two years ago a little better. But this is what I've been listening to a ton over the last few weeks. I saw them live back over the summer. They, they performed at the Auburn University Performing Arts Center, and I just couldn't get enough. I haven't stopped listening to them since then. They're just incredible. So I'm loving having new music. It's, it's very, I mean, kind of indie folk rock kind of thing got a lot of repetitive lyrics and kind of chanty but with their their voices blend together really well great harmonies and it's it's great nice love it haven't heard it added it uh all right tech type of the week well hey i already kind of hinted at mine i i'm just lately trying to make social media a nicer place it's been a goal of mine over the past few years and i'm getting it more and more dialed in every day but using apps like spring and like you know reddit but like with basically like all the main stuff unsubscribed and just small little communities of stuff i like you know things like coffee or pens you know just subscribing to the tiny little communities where people are nice and helpful and then you know using less algorithmic stuff like the facebook and all that so that's that's my tip is to use customize your social media you know use mute filters if you're on twitter mute words you don't want to see and then use apps that make them nicer to use on your device like you know some things like reddit twitter like these these services have third-party apps 
so stuff like Instagram, you're kind of just stuck with the experience they give you. And if it's just constantly like trying to grab your attention with reels and stuff and you don't like that, then, you know, you don't have to use it as much or you can do what you want. But that's what I'm doing is like less of that stuff. That's good. I like that. I like that a lot. My tip of the week is a browser extension that I have been using a lot over the last few months. I, I'm a big Firefox boy. I know there's a lot of Safari and Chrome listeners to a podcast like this, but I've, I've been really enjoying Firefox over the last few years. It's been a lot leaner than it, it had a reputation for for a little while. And, you know, the Mozilla Foundation, they seem like good folks. So anyway, this is a Firefox add-on called Display Anchors with a little pound sign in front of anchors and this is a super useful plugin that does something super nerdy but basically what it does is it lets you link to sections of long web pages which can be super useful so the the main textbook that i use with my music theory courses at wichita state university is an online a free online textbook called open music theory version 2 and it's really great but sometimes i want to send my students to a heading within a single page or a paragraph or a musical example that's on a pretty long-ish page in that book and by book i mean website and the the thing that makes that hard is some websites make it really easy to find a link to a, a particular heading, but some websites don't. And if you know, if you're a big nerd like me, you can open up the source code of the web page and find whatever the little thing is that will let you link and know what to add to the end of the URL to let you send a link to a paragraph. But what this does is it makes the page look temporarily ugly just for you to help you find where these anchors are, but there are anchors all over, not every website, but a lot of websites that you can link to specifically. And so this just turns those on and puts up what those links are and you can click on them and it will redirect you to that thing. And then you can send that new link to your, to your student or your colleague or your family member or your friend, and it will send them not to this big, long, long page that they have to then, you know, search through themselves to find the answer. Instead, you can send them a link that goes just to the one section of the FAQ that they really need to know about, which is really powerful. That's awesome. That's cool. Very cool. <clears throat> I'm sure there are similar plugins and, and extensions for, for Chrome and Safari, but this is the one that, that I'm using. So, Robbie, I don't know how much this has been talked about on your show, so I apologize, but I've already kind of touched on this in, in this episode as well. But I am just loving the updates to focus modes in, in iOS and, and macOS, actually. They're easier to create, and they are just more flexible and customizable. And then when you combine that with how much easier it is to create a custom watch face and custom home screen and lock screen with each focus mode, I, I'm not going all out and always in a focus mode. I do just kind of have a default state, but I have a work focus mode. I have one for the gym that activates right when I get to the gym because most of the time my standard lock screen is just goofy picture. It rotates goofy pictures of my kids. And because I have an always on display now, I don't always want that just when my phone's sitting out at the gym. So I've got, it kind of goes to a colorful background and it, that happens as soon as I get to the gym and it changes my watch face to one where I can quickly start workouts. And it just has added so much convenience with those additions of new lock and home screens and the watch face changing. And then how much easier it is to get people in and out of focus modes that I, I just can't recommend it enough to folks who or interested in that at all. I I love them. I, my two main ones are work and personal. I've got about six or seven of them, but the yeah. linking the mode and the notification settings to the lock screen with all the new lock screen stuff that came out is crazy. I've got like a, mm -hmm. I like how my, so at, for work, I custom made a, a, like a wallpaper that has my school schedule on it. So like when I'm at work, my, like I see, you know, I can just lift my phone and see you know, like what times the classes all start and end, depending on like what kind of schedule we're following that day. And then I've got like an omni focus widget right on there that shows me only work related tasks, kind of like filtered. It's, I don't know, it's just kind of nice to, to get all that stuff dialed in. And then, you know, it's, it's, and it turns on automatically when I get to work, which is yeah. cool. It's cool. Haha, <laughs> we made it. Enjoy your evening, everyone. See you later. Okay, take care. Today, I would like to introduce you to my scale exercise play along tracks with Trap Beats. Available for sale at RobbieBurns.com.
Trap Beat playalongs include over 72 audio recordings, each of which includes a count off, a trap beat at 70 beats per minute, and a tuning drone playing both the tonic and each note of the scale in just intonation so your ensemble can learn to play in tune, develop steady, sustained tone, and blend with other sounds. These drones are stacked over top engaging trap beats that help students to practice at slower tempos while developing steadiness of time and a better concept of how the beat is subdivided. The scale exercises include whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, scale and thirds, and a mini scale with an arpeggio at the end in all 12 keys. I have also included three speed variations of a Remington exercise, so band ensembles can work on their favorite tone and technical exercises, whether they be from a method book or of your own invention. The tracks are $15, but for $40, you can get the stems to the tracks in Logic Pro and GarageBand format, so that you can do things like speed them up and slow them down. Change the pitch. Add your own accompaniment. Take out my voice and add your own. And two, and three, and go. Or even sequence the tracks together to completely automate your ensemble warm-up. These tracks are perfect for running through your Google Meet, Zoom, or virtual teaching platform of choice, or for running through the loudspeakers at the beginning of your in-person rehearsal. Check them out now at robbyburns.com slash store. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for the episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in the podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review this show in the podcast app. It absolutely helps. It'll take a second and just a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about it. Learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. Please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash musicedtechtalk. All support tiers get perks, but even the base tier gets you access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord community, where you can chat with other supporters and guests of the show about music, apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be, and I hope to connect with you soon. Thanks to this week's sponsor, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. Be sure to check it out, and see you next time.